give me your blessing. Almighty God, may what my words be your words. Amen. January 6th, tomorrow, is the actual day of Epiphany. Um, we celebrate the arrival of the Magi, and they finally made it here. Um, and that's going to complete our Christmas cycle and our Christmas crash. Facebook was really buzzing this week about whether or not Epiphany should be celebrated today or whether we should celebrate the second Sunday after Christmas, which in fact it is. Um, my decision was to celebrate Epiphany with you, but you notice that we extended the reading a little bit. So what, what you have in your bulletins is the reading that really was uh, designed for this day. And I thought uh, it might be important for us to hear a little bit of the rest of the story before we go on next week to the baptism of Jesus. Now, we've already talked a little bit about Matthew's technique in his gospel. And we see that happening in a big way today. Matthew, remember, wants to link what's going on in the story of Jesus with what God has already been doing for thousands of years. And the link today comes first of all in our uh, earlier readings, Isaiah and the Psalm. Now in both of those readings, you see that uh, the, uh, there is a reference to kings bringing gifts to the, the new king. And uh, they mention gold and frankincense very specifically. Well, that makes us think that the visitors are kings. We've made that link for a long time, and, and if you were ever in a Christmas pageant, you may remember that maybe you had a crown put on your head. Well, Matthew doesn't call them kings, but that's okay. Um, there are some things that are important for us to take notice of about these characters, whatever they were. First of all, they were foreigners. They were Gentiles who did not understand the scriptures or the traditions of Israel. They were also, we know, wealthy enough to be able to afford a long trip and to bring rich gifts. And Matthew calls them wise men, magi. Um, so they, we know they were devoted to study they were devoted to knowledge and truth. He also tells, them, tells us that they were following a star, so we could refer to them as astrologers. Now that's a curious little detail that uh, we, we add to the story, and to us it's, it's a nice little thing to think about, but to a, a Jewish audience, such as the, the audience that Matthew was writing for, flags would go up. You see, astrology was strictly against Jewish law. So, there's also a little hint of scandal in the arrival of the Magi. And we saw that once before, didn't we, in the, in the Jesus story, when we had the uh, genealogy of Jesus. And he mentioned all those women who had scandals in their lives. So, Matthew is up to something, and we're going to see throughout the whole gospel, when we hear the story played out, that this notion of scandal, people turning away, people uh, making judgments, is going to be a big part of the Jesus story, the way Matthew tells it. Now, we might ask ourselves, why would rich astrologers from the East want to come to see and bring gifts to a king of the Jews? 
We've got to remember that Israel was a conquered nation, and even when they were at their strongest, the height of their so-called empire under Solomon, which was more than a thousand years earlier, there was still a second-rate country, not a player on the world stage at all. So what are they up to? The story says that they went first to the capital city, where of course anybody would expect the new king to be born. And when they get there, they meet Herod. Herod uh, calls his advisors, his wise men, and uh, asks them, well, what do our scriptures say? What's our tradition saying about the birth here? And so he ends up sending these three on to uh, Bethlehem, which is really only about six miles from Jerusalem. And uh, what it seems like is that they got there not just a few days after Christmas, but maybe as much as a couple of years later. They don't find Jesus in a stable. He's in a house. Look at the story. And although it's probably a very ordinary house, which would have confused people looking for a king, they know th nonetheless offer their rich gifts and that they kneel down and worship him. Now a little bit more about Herod. He had a reputation, not just in Israel, but perhaps throughout the whole world, for being insecure. We would have labeled him, uh, the, uh, using our terminology, as a paranoid. He always thought people were out to get him off his throne. So much so, he had one of his wives and four of his own sons murdered because he thought that they were plotting against him. There's no evidence outside of this scripture story of what we've come to call the, the massacre of the innocents, all those little children that he had killed. This is the only place that story shows up. But there's nobody who would have lived a long time uh, ago when, when Herod was around who would deny that it was in him to do that sort of thing. That's the kind of guy he was. Uh, and, and nothing would stop him to, uh, from protecting himself from somebody who might shake his throne. Another thing that we see coming up fairly often in Matthew's version of the Gospel is God speaking to people in dreams. We saw that with Joseph, for example, telling him to get out of town. And we see it now when the angel comes to the Magi in dreams, telling them, don't go back to see Herod. And so they take a different route home. So clearly, Herod feels threatened by Jesus, even though Jesus is still maybe a, a, a little kid, a baby. As the story unfolds, of course, we know Herod was right to be afraid although he didn't live to see Jesus grow up to be a man. This is the guy, Jesus, who is going to be the Messiah that the Magi were looking for. He's going to defend the poor. He's going to comfort the needy. He's going to show oppressors for who they really are. So he's going to turn the values of the world upside down. The poor, the meek, the needy will be blessed, the well-to-do will simply be left out. Herod, I think, was asking himself a question that I know I ask myself, and I suspect it's a good question for all of us to ask. Is the birth of Jesus a good thing for me? Now, the answer to that seems obvious but maybe it's not. When I ask who I am, I see a middle-class white man who's had the benefit of an education. And all of that gives me a certain degree of privilege in this world. Jesus comes along and says, no, 
Get rid of the privilege. Is that a good thing for me? Kind of discomforting, isn't it? To think that the privilege that we have, the benefits that we have, the ease of life that we have, is something that Jesus says, no, nah, that doesn't matter. Get rid of it. Um, <coughs> Herod may have intuited this. And so when he kind of asks the question, is, it, is the birth of Jesus a good thing for me? His answer is a resounding no. And you can see how far he will go to do away with Jesus before Jesus gets a chance to upset the order of things. And years later, though Herod is long gone by then, when Jesus comes back to Jerusalem as a man, the Romans and the temple authorities want to get rid of him, hoping that they can have that happen before the teachings of Jesus catch on. And they're in a very awkward position. The Magi were obviously also privileged people, well-to-do. But for them, the answer to, is this birth of Jesus a good thing, gets an affirmative, yes. So much so that they see it as worth crossing a whole continent for. That's why Matthew refers to them as wise men. The word wise in that time meant you knew the true value of something. Okay? You were smart, street smart. And their time, their effort, their treasure meant less to them than meeting Jesus. The wise men gave. They worshipped. They were searching for a king, and they found the person who would usher in the kingdom of God. So they gave of their wealth. They gave themselves. They let go of privilege so that they could become members of the kingdom of God. They saw hope for the world in this new king, in this kingdom. And when they went home, they took that hope with them. That's the same message that is given to us, the same hope for the world that we live in and for our own lives. If we can turn away from violence, power, wealth, and accept the gift of peace and faith that the King is offering us. <clears throat>